Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Now, as you've seen, today's video is entitled Five Guitar Tones That Stop Me In My Tracks and that pretty much says it all. I've done videos like this before where I've talked about albums that um, kind of influenced me and recently I did a, a video about uh, five TV shows, music uh, oriented TV shows that I grew up watching. But today I'm talking about five specific guitar tones that had a massive effect on me. And um, I've tried to put them roughly in chronological order. So let's go way back into the mists of time here um, with the first one. Now, there are experts in the field who claim that children don't form any lasting memories before the age of two. And I can categorically tell you that that is not the case because my first impression of um, an electric guitar sound predates me being two years old. Um, on July the 2nd, 1968, I was about a year and a half old. And on that date, in this part of the world, this little corner of the northeast of England, something happened which is still spoken of to this day. That date, July the 2nd, 1968, is still known in local uh, folklore as the day it went dark. As you can see here from this um, contemporary local newspaper of the time, the Evening Gazette, um, midnight at midday. Uh, that's exactly what happened, and I vividly remember it. Um, the sky turned literally as black as night. I'm not talking it just went overcast and dull and kind of cloudy. It really did go to be a, as dark as night. Uh, it was some freak weather occurrence, um, you know, some kind of um, combination of clouds and stuff, and no doubt aided and abetted by the smog and pollution that was uh, part and parcel of the heavy industry that was in this area at the time. But it literally did go as dark as night. And then you started getting the thunder and the hailstones and stuff. And previous to this, it had been a, a beautiful, hot, sunny day. And I was at my grandmother's house at the time. She was babysitting me because both my parents were working. And um, my grandmother, she was one of these that uh, she was a very nervous lady. And she would hide under the stairs if a car backfired loud, let alone a thunderstorm. She was really freaking out over... Uh, this um, kind of really freak darkness and, and storm that was happening. Um, so, of course, I was, you know, kind of picking up on this and I was freaking out as well. Then the TV went off. Uh, I was probably watching, what was it, what would I have been watching back then? The Clangers or Mary Mungo and Midge or something like that. So we lost the TV reception, but there was still um, a decent radio reception thanks to good old-fashioned medium wave. And uh, so she put the the radio, or the wireless as she would call it in those days, she put that on and this tune was playing, Apache by The Shadows. And I'd never heard anything like it. I really hadn't. This just, you know, previous to, 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 to the radio going on, I was crying and I was scared and, you know, all the rest of it, as you would be at that age under such circumstances. But this just kind of transported me to another world. It was like suddenly I didn't know music could be this exciting, this exhilarating. I didn't know music could kind of give you this feeling of warm, fuzzy happiness. Um, and, that, you know, that this did. And uh, apparently I got really upset again when the tune finished. And I, I, I would go, Nana, again, again. And when I realised that she couldn't make that piece of music happen again because it was on the radio, you know, um, I, I apparently started crying again. But anyway, when my parents uh, picked me up uh, when, they, when they finished work, I think there must have been a conversation that happened along the lines of, if ever you need to shut him up and stop him bawling his lungs out, then there's this piece of music on the radio early, earlier called Apache, and it really did the trick. Because not long after that, there was a Shadows LP that uh, seemed to turn up and get played rather a lot in our house, and uh, much joy did it bring. So, there you go. That is how Hank Marvin saved my uh, sanity on the day it went dark, July the 2nd, 1968. So, let's move on to the next one. Now, 
Uh, this takes us to uh, about 1984, and I was 17 years old. And like all 17-year-olds, uh, your primary obsession is with, ex- w- is with impressing either girls or your mates. And one way that you can do this is to seem clued up about music. And there was a lot of buzz in the media, in the music press and stuff, and uh, on shows like Old Grey Whistle Test on TV. There was a lot of buzz about this fella called Bruce Springsteen had a new album coming out. And I kind of vaguely knew the name, you know. Um, I did know that Bruce Springsteen had written a song that was a, that I quite liked, uh, From Small Things, Big Things Come, which had been done by Dave Edmonds, and I really loved that song that had been out a year or two before. Um, so, you know, I, in order to appear cool and knowledgeable, I, did, I was going around uh, to anyone who would listen, saying, have you heard the new Springsteen album then? And oh, who's Bruce Springsteen? You know, oh, I can't believe you've never heard of Bruce Springsteen. You know, being that sort of arrogant, cocky teenager that um, that we all were at one point. Some of us grew out of it. Um, anyway, cut a long story short, I bought uh, Born in the USA, which was the album that everyone was talking about, and there was a track on there called Darlington County. And given that I live pretty close to Darlington in the UK, you know, I wonder what that's about, you know. Um, so I listened to it, and just that that sound, that guitar sound, what I later, very soon afterwards, found out to be the, the sound of a, te- a Fender Telecaster on its bridge pickup, playing this insanely catchy riff that just made you want to kind of stamp your foot and, and sing along. Um that coupled with the the kind of the Hammond organ that's on that track as well, just that's still a, a, a sonic combination that I love. It just it's just quintessential distilled essence of Americana to me. That that whole kind of Telecaster sound and um, especially with with the, um, the the Hammond organ there. But that 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 guitar tone, the uh, the Fend- Bruce's Fender Telecaster on its bridge pickup, playing that Darlington County riff, was probably the first time I really noticed that a Telecaster, what it sounded like, you know, where I could identifiably tell the difference between the sound of one electric guitar and another electric guitar. And I knew that I loved that particular sound. And it's all the way through that album. Bruce's Telecaster sound is quite prominent on many of the tracks on that album. And yeah, I've loved Telecasters ever since. And that is the first time I can genuinely say that you know, I, I could tell that that was a Telecaster and I knew what it was and, yeah, made a big impression on me. Also, round about that time, uh, probably about, um, I think it was a year or so later, um, you know, kind of, about I think it was about Christmas 85, I was home on a holiday from college at Christmas and uh, Channel 4 in the UK screened this thing called Blue Suede Shoes, a rockabilly session with Carl Perkins and friends. And what it was, was basically, well, you know, it was Carl Perkins uh, in concert, essentially, uh, in a TV studio. And Dave Edmonds uh, provided the house band. It was Dave Edmonds and his touring band, who were the kind of the, the backing musicians for the whole thing. And Ringo Starr came out and did a couple of numbers. So did George Harrison and so did Eric Clapton. And this was one of the last times, I think, when Eric was still using his famous mongrel strat called Blackie. And, oh dear me, what a sound he got on that. Now, I'm the first person to admit that there are times uh, when Eric's playing when you just get the feeling that he's possibly just paying the mortgage, really. Um, you know, but when he's on fire, when he's on form, when that electricity is there... Uh, there are few guitarists in the world who can touch him, you know, in terms of just the the phrasing and the excitement and just the just the sheer energy that comes through in his playing. Um, all of these uh, examples that I'm talking about are all linked below. So check out, um, I think it's Mean Woman Blues from uh, that particular rockabilly session where Eric plays like solo after solo, and you can see Carl Perkins just kind of shaking his head and laughing and thinking, this guy's on fire tonight. And 
Eric's sound there that he was getting from Blackie, I don't know what he was plugged into. It was probably, um, I think, wasn't he using Music Man amps around about that time? I'm not sure. But what a sound. What an incredible sound he was getting there. And, yeah, big favourite sound of mine to this day. What we got next? Yes, Gary Moore. How can I talk about my favourite guitar tones without once mentioning Gary Moore? Now, Gary is best probably remembered these days for playing a Les Paul, but when I first got into Gary's music, it was in the sort of early to mid-80s, and one of the albums that I discovered back then uh, was Corridors of Power, where I think he was playing his famous Red Strat on that album. And, dear me, what a sound. Take a listen to... uh, the cover of Free's Wishing Well that he does on uh, that uh, on that album, and just when he kind of hits us, there's there's one string bend right at the beginning of the solo that just absolutely clobbers me around the head every time I hear it. It's just so dissonant but sweet at the same time, and it's just a simple little kind of um, you know kind of bend where you know you're kind of bending on one string and grabbing a note on the other string i'd show you on this guitar only i'm not plugged in at the moment um so yeah gary moore's tone on that whole corridors of power album uh specifically the solo on wishing well i was just kind of getting into gary uh gary's music at the time and you know I was coming at it from you know kind of a blues and and rock pers- and, and rock and roll perspective, um, and there was just something to my ears about the way Gary played and about you know the guitar tone that he got that made him stand apart from all of the other kind of you know poodle perm spandex clad eighties um, rock guitar heroes at the time you know your Jake E Lees and. Um, you know, who else would be there, like John Sykes and uh, Warren DiMartini and all of these guys who were the kind of the, the, the fast gunslinger guitarists at the time. Gary just kind of somehow had something else going on. And obviously, later on, I found out what that was. He was essentially a blues guitarist and a very, very fine one indeed. But yeah, that was probably the first Gary Moore tone that made me go, what is that, you know? Um, so, that was number four on the list. What is number five? Well, I've got to tell you, and I know I'm going to get shouted out for this, but I'm not the world's biggest Jimi Hendrix fan, okay? You know, I, I, I do... I mean, I'm not saying I dislike Jimi Hendrix, and I guess it was a case of you had to be there, you know, Uh, you had to kind of be, you know, part of that experience, (laughs) the Hendrix experience, you had to be part of that whole kind of um, thing where we'd gone within the short space of time from hearing, you know, an electric guitar that sounded like Hank Marvin, nothing wrong with that, and then suddenly along comes this this wild-eyed hippie dude with a strat slung upside down making screaming banshee noises with it it never really resonated with me to be honest with you until i got into hendrix through stevie ray vaughan the version of voodoo child on stevie ray vaughan's uh, couldn't stand the weather album suddenly made me think okay i get it Okay, so I've got Stevie Ray Vaughan to thank for getting me into Jimi Hendrix. I'm still not the world's biggest Jimi Hendrix fan, uh, but I kind of, it it took that, um, I always say that Stevie translated Jimi for me. Do you know what I mean? It, it kind of, he was, he was my Jimi Hendrix interpreter. And just the sound that uh, Stevie gets on uh, that version of Voodoo Child is just, it's, it's a real kind of punch you in the guts kind of sound. It just knocks you sideways and it is absolutely gobsmackingly brilliant. And that made me kind of go back and, and listen to um, Jimmy with a fresh set of ears and, and maybe reappraise some of the, the opinions I had about him about maybe just being a bit of a novelty act, you know, the whole playing behind his head, playing guitar with his teeth, setting fire to it. Because let's face it, you know. <laughs> If you if you're not a big Jimi Hendrix aficionado and you know 
what clips do you see of Jimmy on TV or wherever as you're growing up? You see him setting light to his guitar. You see him playing it behind his head, etc., etc. And it just, it all just seemed a bit gimmicky to me until, as I say, uh, Mr. Stevie Ray Vaughan acted as my Jimi Hendrix interpreter and made me kind of go back and have a listen to it and maybe rethink uh, my attitudes a little bit. But yeah, that is a fantastic album, Couldn't Stand the Weather. I think it's one of Stevie's strongest albums, if not the strongest, and uh, probably my favourite track off that. It would be a choice between uh, Voodoo Child and Scuttlebutt in. I mean, there's another track that absolutely uh, just makes your jaw hit the floor when you hear it. Um, uh, scuttle button so yeah anyway as i say links to all of these are in the description box below and i would be over the moon if you would tell me which five guitar tones are the ones that have had similar effects on you and um yeah so it's friday um i've only got one more guitar lesson to do for the before the day is done and then I think I'll be going for a beer, so I shall leave it there for today. I'll just mention, as I always do, that um, I have a course on sale. Well, actually, I've got another course on sale at the moment. Uh, you know about the modes one that I've mentioned in all the videos up to now. Well, if that one's a little bit rich for your palate, you know, if maybe kind of playing the whole modal side of things is, is maybe just asking a bit too much of you at the moment, and you want some advice on beginning your journey as a lead guitarist, then check out uh, the URL below the lessons page on my website where you will find play lead guitar the easy way and it basically does exactly what it says on the tin you get um, loads of jam tracks you get uh, loads of licks you get plain English explanations and I've deliberately kept all of the boring scale practice and music theory gubbins all to an absolute bare minimum we do have to cover a little bit of it obviously but it's it's not uh, the main part of the course you go, you go through that course and you will find that you, that you are playing cool sounding lead guitar solos before you know it, I promise you. Anyway, with that, oh by the way, yes, if you would like some tailored one-to-one -one guitar tuition, how could I forget this? Uh, give me a shout by, via the details at the end of this video and uh, if you live on Teesside in the northeast of England, uh, you can come along for a face-to-face -face lesson or wherever else you are in the world, you can have a lesson via Skype. And whichever way you do it, of course, your first lesson is free. But you probably knew that anyway, because I mention it often enough. So I'd just like to take a moment now to say thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, um, please hit the subscribe button. Give me a like, hit the notification bell. And uh, yeah, so thanks for watching. And I look forward to seeing you all again next time around. Bye for now, folks.